from now and ever to the ages of all ages. Amen. Quick question, show of hands. How many of you, when you get a new device, a phone, an iPad, I don't know, uh, whatever it may be, um, the first thing you do before you even turn it on is open the user's manual. Show of hands. Anybody? Anybody? You, you are the smart ones, right? <laughs> okay, how many of you have had this experience? Okay, this is, this is my usual experience with this. Um, you get a new device, you're super excited, you turn it on, you're like, God, I hope they pre-charge this thing, right? And I don't have to charge it overnight before I can use it. And then you, you, you turn it on, guess what? It turns on, that's fantastic, and then off you go, you're off to the races, and you're, you're doing your thing, and you're playing away with it, and then probably like six months later or something, you discover the user's manual in like a drawer somewhere, and you have nothing better to do with your time than read it. And so you start flipping through it, and you discover all of these new features, and you're like, man, why didn't anybody tell me about this? Anybody had that experience before? Yes, that is my chronic experience. On a, on a similar note, but a slightly different example, um, Mary and I honeymooned uh, in uh, the Holy Land. Um, we got a special authorization from a few bishops uh, to go there because it was, there, was, there was still some question whether uh, you know Coptic people could visit there and so on. Um, and we had a great time. Um, arguably, we were prior to the wedding, we were busy preparing for the wedding, and on our honeymoon, we were very much interested in each other as much as we were interested in the Holy Land. Um, so there were a lot of things that we didn't see. And when we came back, um, I got, I, you know, speaking <coughs> to some of my friends and so on, and they would tell me, oh, did you see this? And I'd be like, uh, no, did you see that? And I was like, oh, I didn't know that existed, right? Or like that, you know, it was a sight to see or anything like that. So, um, about a couple of years ago, Mary, we did a trip, with a church trip, was it, two years ago? We did a church trip uh, to the Holy Land, and we planned it to the T, I mean to the second. We planned it, and we made this, this like, 100-page, like, user's manual, right? With, uh, with the sites that we were going to see, the sites we weren't going to see, but were in the vicinity, quiet time passages. I mean, we decked it out. You know what I mean? And it was like everything that I didn't get to do and the stuff that I enjoyed doing on my first trip, we did for the second one. And something in me was, was so grateful that I got to kind of redeem myself, that I got this second chance to, 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 to live out this trip to the fullest. Um, but the only way I could have done that is if I would have read the user's name. Right? The only way that we're going to get to talk and reading the Bible and so on later, but that's not what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is that everything that was made by a maker, or in this case a creator, slight difference, was made with purpose. And the purpose is placed in the thing which is made by the maker. And something we're going to talk about a little bit later in this talk is that oftentimes we, especially in Western culture, we've got it all backwards. See, our culture, or the, the culture we at least are, are, are sort of, you know, residing in, has forgotten about God. And so since it's forgotten about the Maker, it tries to find its purpose elsewhere. And finding its, we find, once we find a purpose, we find an identity. So when oftentimes when people will introduce themselves, say, "Hi, my name is John. I'm a priest." So my priest, uh, my priesthood has become my identity. But my identity is not my purpose. My purpose comes from my identity, comes from my maker. But when you cancel the maker and you cancel, then you cancel the identity. Then you find these people with no identity searching for purpose. They find purpose, and from their purpose, they define an identity. It's all backwards. It's all backwards. My name is John Boutros. I came from Meher Boutros, who came from Ibrahim Rufail, etc. Boutros. I have a lineage. I come from somewhere. And from the place that I came from, that's who I am. I remember as a physician, 
you know, as a, as a surgeon, I think there's another surgeon in the room, right? We, we, we write the worst notes in, in patients' charts, right? Right? All vital signs, stable abdomen, soft, continue current plan. Next, right? And we keep going. We have like something like 80 patients to see in, in 30 minutes, you know what I mean? Right? And we need to make sure they're alive, we need to make sure they're well, we need to make sure that they know that they're humans and we know that they're humans, right? But we don't have time to write, to do write notes, right? And so, so I was discussing this with my dad, and my dad asked me a question. He said to me, do you sign your name at the bottom of your notes? And I said, yes, I do. He said, make sure that every time you write your name, you are proud of what you've written your name on. Doesn't matter what other people think of it. It matters that you're proud of what you have done. Because you carry a name, you carry the name Boutros, and you should be proud of that. And that really struck a note. When I went back to work after a week of holiday, I made sure that whatever I wrote, no matter how small or how great, I was proud of it. Because you know what? I'm proud of my dad, and I'm my biological father, and I'm proud of where I come from, and I'm proud of what he's done. And I'm, I'm proud of who I am. Not like, you know, not, we have things all confused when we read about pride and the Desert Fathers. They're not talking about this. They're talking about that I, I, have, I have dignity. There's integrity to my person. I come from somewhere. I have an origin. But that all, that all <coughs> defines the purpose. It modulates everything that you do. I do things differently because of where I've come from and because of who, who has made me. And so when we, lose, when we lose our connection, when we lose our connection of what we are meant for, then everything goes, everything goes pear-shaped, right? Everything goes kind of bonkers. And so Jesus tells us, he tells us, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly, like we just introduced last night, and we're going to kind of continue with that now. So you see, this is where the problem is. The problem all started in the garden. The problem all starts in the garden when Eve has this conversation with the serpent. And the serpent says to Eve, Now, God didn't tell you, if you eat from this tree, you will die will not surely die. And Eve says, well, he told us not to eat from the tree. And you know, the serpent wasn't lying at that point. God didn't say you will die. He said, by death you shall die. He didn't say if you take a bite from the tree, from the apple, or from the fruit, or you will die. He said, by death you shall die. And you're like, no, that's just like, like you'll die, like, right? <laughs> like, in plain English, you're going to die, right? N notice, and they, didn't, they, they probably didn't even know what that meant because they had never seen anything die because they lived in paradise, preserved by the life of God. And so, he offers her a counterfeit. He tells her, if you eat from this tree, you can become like God. But hold on a second, Dave. When God created you, He created you in His image and? In His image and? So Eve, don't you already, aren't you already like God? So what He offers her is a counterfeit. He does a quick exchange, a slight, a slight of hand, slate of hand, how's that say, the expression goes, right? Right? And He offers her a fake, a look-alike. What's the problem with a look-alike. Anybody here have a 20-pound note, 10-pound note, 5-pound note? I know it's on the 20-pound note. I need a 20-pound note. Anybody? I promise I'll give it back. Maybe. <laughs> here we go. So, on this 20-pound note, it says, under the Bank of England, can you read that for us? I promise to pay the bearer of the month the sum of 20 pounds. 
So it says, I promise to pay the bear a sum of 20 pounds. Who promises? The queen. The queen. The big one, right? So this is only as legitimate, this is only as valuable as the person whose face is on this note. And if the person whose face is on this note recognizes it and says, yes, this is indeed a promise from me. If they say, oh, I don't know, I don't know who wrote this, this is fake, all of a sudden it loses all of its value. Thank you very much for your 20 pound note. Right? You weren't sure, eh? And they looked very suspicious whether you were getting it back or not. <laughs> right? And the serpent does something very cunning. He opens Eve's eyes to make three observations about the fruit. And the counterfeits he offers us today bear at least one of these three characteristics. And I'm going to tell you now a secret of spiritual life. All temptation is going to come from one of these three. There's only three temptations out there. There's only three different temptations out there. And then they, they just wear different costumes, right? But it's the same one. And this is good news because as we go through the talk, we're going to talk about the, 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 the victory over these temptations, at least in brief, right? So, open your Bibles to Genesis 3, 6. This is a verse to memorize. Genesis 3, 6, and somebody read it for us. Somebody got it? So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took off its fruit and ate. So what were those three, <coughs> what were her three observations? It was? Good for food. Good for food. Pleasant, pleasant, to, pleasant to the eyes. Desirable, desirable to make wise. one wise. All temptations are one or more of these three things. Don't believe me? Okay, you keep, you know, somebody keep keep that verse because we'll probably come back to it. Somebody else open for us 1 John 2. I want to say 17. 16 and 17. 1 John 2, 16. While somebody's doing that, somebody else open for us Matthew 4. 4. 6 and 9. Matthew 4, and I'll tell you where to go from there so that you don't have to trouble yourself to remember. And somebody else open for us 2 Timothy, chapter 2. <coughs> chapter 3, 2 Timothy, chapter 3. Okay, who's got for us 1 John 2, 16 and 17? So, sorry, the persons, uh, people in, uh, who had Genesis. Somebody still have Genesis open? I asked somebody to, to keep Genesis. Uh, was good for food? Yeah? Pleasant to the eyes. Pleasant to the eyes? Desirable, Desirable to make one wise. Okay. And then what does uh, 1 John 2, 16 say? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Sound familiar? Who's got Matthew 4 for us? <laughs> what, are, what are Christ's three temptations? Read us what Satan says to Jesus, the three, the three temptations. You're going to need to skip around. Right, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Food? Okay. Um, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. So he takes him up on the pinnacle of the temple. Now the temple 
was on Mount Zion. Mount Zion was the highest point in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was built on a mountain. So, the mountain, so the, the, the pinnacle of the temple is on Mount Zion, which is in Jerusalem, which is on a mountain. So he's at the highest point of the highest point of the highest point of the city of Jerusalem. He says, throw yourself down. Everybody will clap for you. The angels will bear you up in their hands. Everybody will clap for you. Everybody will see. Everybody will praise you. The pride of life, right? Or that doesn't work. So then he tempts Jesus with. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain. Yeah, well, it sounds very similar, huh? But it's going to be good. Him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. So he says, this time he doesn't tempt him with pride of life. He tempts him with, I will give you all of these things. Folks in the room, have you ever wanted to buy another pair of shoes and then felt like, ah, oh, probably shouldn't. That would be materialistic, right? <laughs> Or you were walking through the mall and you saw something and you said, and you, and you said to yourself, oh, I really want that. And you're like, ah, oh, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't, right? You're tempted by a pair of shoes or a sweater or a coat or a car. The, the devil tempted Jesus. He said, I will give you everything. <laughs> Three temptations. The philosophers, the Greek, this is, this is like a, this is like theological anthropology. This is like this is theology understanding our humanity, the human condition. Greek philosophers, Greek philosophers before Jesus, they knew this, and they said that there are only three different, really different kinds of of, of things which cause humanity to fall and do ridiculous things, to do foolish things, to destroy their lives, and they are. Hedonism, love of pleasure, humanism, love of self, materialism, love of stuff. The theologians then came and said, really it's not just the love of, because the commandment is to love the Lord your God or to love, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So when you love something else or whatever it may be, rather than God, what you're really doing is you're attributing deity to that. So, really, it's these three temptations are hedonism, God is pleasure, humanism, I am God, <coughs> materialism, stuff is God. And we worship these things as God. And that's really, that's it, that's the only, those are the only temptations. And the devil dresses them up as all kinds of different stuff. Gluttony, sexual lust, that are all of that, everything that's pleasure is in one bucket. Everything that is self is one bucket. Everything that is stuff is another bucket. The good news that I have for you is that anybody, does anybody remember the chorus of Psalm 150 during Great Lent? During communion, we sing Psalm 150. And, you know, praise God and all his saints. Alleluia, alleluia. Jesus Christ for us 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus Christ fasted for us. Jesus Christ fasted for us, was tempted for us, and was victorious for us, for you and for me. And he was the trailblazer that, that forged the path for us of victory over temptation. It starts with fasting, and we're going to talk about this in the later talks, how we participate, our participation in the life of Christ. It starts with fasting, it has temptation in it, and in the end there is victory. <coughs> who, who had 2 Timothy for us? Perilous times will come at the end. 2 Timothy 3. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasure, and lovers of money. And there is a form of godliness in these people. 
He's not talking about the heathens out there. He's talking about the counterfeits in here. <coughs> He's talking about the counterfeits in here because they have a form of godliness. They look and smell kind of godly, kind of holy, but they have no power. And that, my friends, is the tragedy. You want stuff? Have stuff. You want pleasure? Have, have pleasure. Have whatever pleasure you want. You want to big yourself up? Big yourself up, man. Go for it. Live it up. You the man. Go for it. <laughs> the problem is this, is that it has no power. That's the problem. The problem is that our God is such a fantastic God. We don't believe in a <coughs> petty God who, if you uh, come to church late, he'll be upset with you. But if you come early, he'll be happy. But if you come before Abuna, you... Right? is <laughs> <laughs> God's, God's up and down. Right? Because my spiritual life is up and down, up and down. So God is going to go up and down, up and down. He needs mood stabilizers. Right? Any psychiatrists in the room? Help him out. Right? Of course not. This beautiful teachings of the impassibility of God. That God is forever the same. So, so, so God, yes, does exhibit emotions, and our emotions are an icon or an image or likeness of His, but ours are very much distorted. God's anger is very different from my anger, or more properly said, my anger is very different from His, and so on. <laughs> and we're not going to talk about that right now. But the problem is the problem is that there's no power. God's not upset with you when you fall into temptation. He's not angry with you. This, he's not... He's not uh, uh, Furious with you, <coughs> hating, hating you. No, not at all. Not at all. In fact, he, he exhibits compassion with you and with me. The problem is not God. The problem is me. The problem is there's no power in my life. The problem is, is that I stand before the cheeseburger during fasting and I crumble. That's the problem. The problem is I've become like a brute beast, like an animal, following my instincts, unable to control myself. That's not what we were made to be. In fact, St. Athanasius in On the Incarnation says something really beautiful. This is from, uh, this is from uh, chapter 1, section 11, paragraph <coughs> 3. He says, God being good, he gives them a share in his own image, our Lord Jesus Christ, and makes them after his own image and after his likeness, so that by such grace, perceiving the image that is the word of the Father, they may be able through him to get an idea of the Father, and knowing their maker, live the happy and truly blessed life. God wants the Father, has given you and me, to see Christ, to see the life of Christ, that we might see Him, understand ourselves, because we're made in the image and likeness of Him, but we're distorted, right? We're all smudged, and we're all messy, and we're all dirty, and we're, we're, we're Ezekiel 16, you know, uh, in our blood, and in our dirt, and in our mud, in the field, naked, right? And so we've forgotten where we came from. We've forgotten what we're supposed to look like, but when we look at Christ, we see Him and we see His relationship to the Father and we realize who we are and then we can live the truly happy and blessed life. This is God's goal. The God is, God's goal is for you to live a life with power. In um, North America, we have these two liter bottles of soda. The problem with two liter bottles of soda is somebody invariably forgot to put the cap on them, right? And uh, you know, when there's like this much left in the bottom, you open the fridge and you're so excited for that cold pop, <laughs> right? And uh, you right, and you pour it out and you drink and you drink deep. And what's the problem with it? It has no fizz, right? It has no fizz. It looks like the real thing, but 
It's been sitting there for so long, it's stale and it has no fizz. In the beginning of the liturgy, during the offering, the deacons offer the, 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 the wine. The priest takes the wine and gives it to his partner priest to take a sniff. And he, and he gives it to the, to the deacons to take a sniff. And what are they smelling for? They're smelling to see, and I'm not a biochemist, maybe the biochemist in the room can tell us. They're, they're sniffing to see if it's undergone some biochemical process in which the alcohol has been, become vinegar. And the smell of it is very distinct. It smells like vinegar, right? What's the problem? Will people be poisoned if they, if they drink a little bit of vinegar? No. Is vinegar bad for you? No. What's the problem? Is it's lost its spirit. It's lost its spirit. It has no more spirit. It has no more power. Uh, uh, places that sell alcohol in North America, liquor stores, liquor, beer, wine, and spirits. It has spirit. If you drink enough of it, kind of changes you. Gives you a better sense of humor. Right? <laughs> kind of greases the wheels a little bit. Makes you laugh a little bit more easily. Doesn't it miss you a little bit? It changes you. It changes... I'm not suggesting we all go get tipsy, okay? That's not... <laughs> what I learned in the conference, your mama is... <laughs> oh boy, here we go. Right? Here's a that I'm not The problem is it has no power. When we find our identity backwards, when we find our identity in our purpose, rather than finding our purpose and our identity, we have no power. What defines you? Something temporary? I was so blessed to start my surgical training at a time when all of my surgical mentors were retiring. Some of them retired really well, and some of them, oh my goodness, they were miserable, and they made everybody else miserable. And they just kept coming back to the hospital, and they were so miserable. They didn't know what to do with themselves. And I asked myself, I don't want to be like that. I want to be like that. And I asked myself, what's the difference? See, these people had an identity. This guy, he, he, his identity was he is a surgeon. That was the entirety of his identity. He lived at the hospital. He saved an innumerable number of lives. He did an unestimable amount of good to humanity during his career. But now, he is nobody. I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that. So right from the start, I realized I have to have an identity. At the same time, I was really blessed with one of my friends who's a school teacher, who uh, I, I will watch him have a conversation with a stranger. This person was, was talking with him and so on. He said, so, his name is Peter. So, Peter, what do you do? And he said, uh, I'm a Christian. And the guy said to him, no, I mean, like, like, you know, what do you do between your nine to five? He says, the commandments of Jesus. He said, this to <laughs> He's like, no, you don't understand. Like, I mean, like, 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 who cuts your paycheck, right? And he says, uh, God. <laughs> he gave me, he gave me what he gave me, gave me my task, gave me my skills. So he's, and he says to him, no, you don't understand. <laughs> like, what is your occupation? To do the will of him who sent me. <laughs> this guy wanted to rip his head off. Finally, he said, finally says to him, okay, so, so what, what do you do while you're being a Christian from like 9 to 5 or 8 to 3? Or he goes, oh, like, I'm a history school teacher. So, oh. <laughs> right? And it made me realize, and when I, because I, Peter's a, a dear, very dear friend of mine, and so what I, uh, he's, he's a priest now, Father Peter, and what I realized is that this was, this was entirely, perfectly true. It was a, a very accurate description of him. That his life is being a Christian, of which he spends a, a certain amount of time of it being a school teacher, a certain amount of time of it being a servant at church, a certain amount of time of being a husband, being a son, and so on, and all these other roles, being a great friend. And, but none of these things define him they're all, they're all part of his Christian life. 
But that's not how we de define ourselves. If you want to read more about this, you can read Life of the Beloved by Henry Noun. And he talks about how most of the time we define ourselves by I am by I am what people say about me. I am my accomplishments, <coughs> or I am what I have. Sound familiar? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. The problem is we've been subject to a quick slate of hand. We've been subject to a quick exchange room. And all of a sudden now, we're living for things that don't give us power. You ever plug your phone in at night, you go to a hotel or something, you're not at home, okay? You're somewhere that's new to you. You plug your phone in the wall and you pass out. In the morning, you find your phone dead, right? And then you go and you're like, maybe I can plug it in properly. You plug it in, you plug it in, and you find out that the socket doesn't work. There's no power in the socket. That's what we're doing, right? We're trying to charge our lives. We're trying to charge our lives and find power in pleasure. Ain't there. We're trying to charge our lives, find power in self. Isn't there. We're trying to charge our lives, find power in stuff. It isn't there. There's no power in it. These are expenses, not investments. <coughs> Get stuff. I'm not, I'm not, I love the poor and I love serving the poor and we're going to talk very briefly about that. But <clears throat> that's not what I'm ta here to talk about. You want stuff? Have you get stuff? Get whatever you want. I don't care. But, but don't be fooled in thinking that stuff or pleasure or self is going to give you, is going to give you, it's going to charge you. And the trouble, the deeper problem is that these pursuits are endless. These pursuits are endless. Quoting from a, a similar portion of On the Incarnation, um, St. Athanasius says, But men, once more in their perversity, having set at naught, and in spite of all of this, the grace given them, so wholly rejected God, and so darkened their soul, as not merely to forget the idea of God, but also to fashion for themselves one invention after another. For not only did they grave idols for themselves instead of the truth, and honor things that were not before the living God, and serve the creature rather than creator, but worse, they all, of all, they transferred the honor of God even to stocks and stones and every material object and to men, and went further than this than we have said in a former treatise. He's saying that generation after generation, they were inventing greater and greater wickedness. I spoke about this in a previous talk and I did some research, right? So I figured, let me try to find something in each category. So for pleasure, you know, I remember seeing on YouTube like these 10,000 calorie challenges, right? Where people try to eat 10,000 calories in a day or even worse, 10,000 calories in a meal. So like I, you know, YouTube 10,000 calorie challenge, right? I hit it. Oh dude, that is old news. We're at the 20,000 calorie challenge now, right? So what happened? Like food used to be fuel. Now food is, I don't know what, I can't, you know, like there's a saying that I say to myself all the time and I say to other people all the time, I say it mostly to myself, food is fuel, not fun. Food is fuel, not fun. Food is fuel, not fun. I'm trying to brainwash myself, right? I resist like my third portion, right? <laughs> but this isn't even fun. This is like, this is food is fuel, not what? Torture. Anyways, right? <laughs> And it progresses, like it progresses. One invention after another, after another. <coughs> so, uh, so for pride, um, uh, I googled sort of like, I was trying to find like the greatest accomplishments that are absolutely meaningless, right? So the longest someone ever played a video game, some girl in 2015 played Just Dance for five days, 18 hours and 34 seconds. Now, I don't know how she held it in for that long, you know, <laughs> or she used some alternative means to empty her bladder for five days and 18 hours and 34 seconds. But I am certain that the makers of Just Dance did not make it so that you would play it for five days, 18 hours and 34 seconds, right? Inventing wickedness upon wickedness. And then when it got to pleasure, all I can tell you is 
You know, there are things, St. Paul tells us in Ephesians 5, that it is, it is unfitting for us to mention, right? It is unfitting for us to, to repeat, you know? Uh, like, so I'm not even going to go there, because uh, I did some research and I realized I don't even want to talk about this. Uh, it's, so, uh, it's, so, it's so way out there, right? If, if, you, if, you, look, if you look in Haggai... Haggai is, the, 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 the book of Haggai is only two chapters. This was at a time when the people had returned back to Jerusalem after, after captivity. And they had started rebuilding the temple. With Nehemiah, they built the wall. And with Ezra, they put the cornerstone and they started to rebuild the temple. And then, somehow, they took a break for like 14 years, right, from building the temple. And they built their own houses. So how do you build your house? No problem. And then they paneled their houses. They built luxury homes, and God's house was still in ruins. So God sent them two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. They come right after each other to stir the people up, both to repentance and to encourage them, Haggai, and to bring them to repentance. And Zechariah, a little bit of repentance, but a lot of encouragement to rebuild the temple. And if you look in Haggai chapter 1, verse 5 through 7, it says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Consider your ways, John. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And you earn wages you earn wages and put in a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord, consider your ways. Is this you? Are you working hard? Are you pedaling, 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 pedaling? But kind of going nowhere? Are you working hard? Burning the midnight oil? Burning the candle at both ends? But kind of have nothing to show for it? Maybe you're putting wages in a bag, in a purse. It has holes. Maybe I'm drinking salt water, hoping to, hoping to no longer be thirsty. The problem is these things have no power. So God is calling you and me today, now, to let go. To let go of these things. And to find our purpose, our meaning. To find our identity. In him. To find our identity in him. <coughs> Finding our identity in him, find our purpose comes from that. But our identity, our real true identity, which lasts to eternity, will never come from our purpose. Lately, I have a, uh, our church has a lot of young people, as many churches do. Um, and so lately I've been finding myself counseling a lot of young adults and their parents. So uh, it's very awkward, you know, when you hear the story from one person and then you hear the story from somebody else, right? And um, what I'm encountering oftentimes now is parents who have loved their children so much they have devoted the entirety of their lives to their children. But they, they're, they're at a terrible time now because their children have grown up and become adults, and they kind of want to fly away, and the parents are like reeling them back in, you know, right? Why? Because, not because they need them, you know, if they need them, yes, absolutely, honor your father and your mother, serve them, you know, with all your heart, and, 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 and God will honor you. No, it, because the, the parents have no identity. My identity is in my children. If they are saying, da, 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 all this, then, then what's left of my life? It made it, it made me, this so clear to me. I went home and, and I repented and I cried before God. And I told him, Lord God, please don't allow me to live for a purpose that will, I won't outlive. That I will outlive. I don't want to live longer than my purpose. I don't want to live long enough to see my purpose fulfilled. I don't. Because here I'll be, the oldest I've ever been, the sickest I've ever been, the weakest I've ever been, probably the poorest I've ever been in my life. Elderly, tired, senile, you know. 
in diapers, <laughs> trying to find a new purpose for which to live. God, no. I want to work all my life for a purpose, and I want to see it fulfilled from the other side. I want to see it fulfilled from the other side. Because when I'm senile and 80-some, and, and I'm going to start trying to figure out why I should be alive, what purpose there should be to my life, and feel like my life has no purpose, I can hardly, I can hardly keep, my, keep my grasp on the purpose of my life now. What am I going to do then? God, no, I don't want to outlive my purpose. Don't let your identity be something that you will outlive. So, what are we going to do? Let's be practical. First of all, I want to just touch on temptation. And then I want to close that chapter. Because we're here to talk about abundant life, I'm not here to talk about how to stay out of trouble. Right? <coughs> if you want to know, and we could do a whole conference about this, but we won't do this conference about this. If you want to know how to overcome temptation, look at what Jesus did. Right? Jesus forged the way for us. So when he was tempted with pleasure, what did he answer? Change these stones into bread. What was his answer? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. So, most of the time, the pleasure that we feel that's tempting us is a faint symptom or... The, the, the word I guess we prefer to use in medicine is, is like a referred symptom. So I'll give you a classic example. People who have gallbladder pain don't come into hospital saying, I have gallbladder pain. They come into hospital usually saying, I have shoulder pain. Why do they come in saying, I have shoulder pain? Because there's a nerve which comes from your brain and runs through by your shoulder and goes to your gallbladder. And it goes all kinds of different other places. And so when that nerve is activated, your brain gets, oh, the nerve is activated. There must be a problem in like any of one of these areas, right? All of these indistinct things you've never felt and you would have no idea where they are because they're deep down inside you somewhere and your shoulder. And so your shoulder is the most thing you can relate to the most. You're like, oh, I have pain in my shoulder, but the pain is actually coming from your gallbladder. Okay, if that was a little esoteric and a little out there for you, here's something that's a little bit more, more simple. You know, when you're, uh, when, when, if you read a little bit about health and all this stuff, they say 90%, I don't know who, says, who, who studied this, but they say 90% of the time that you think you're hungry, you're actually thirsty. Try drinking two large glasses of water, wait half an hour and see if you're still hungry. Well, if you do that, you'll probably notice that most of the times you do that, you're no longer hungry, right? So... I think I'm hungry, I'm feeling a stimulus, and it's telling me, you're hungry, right? But what I'm actually is that I'm thirsty. And then so, what do I do? I go buy myself a bag of chips, and I'm like, this'll do, right? Salt, salt, salt. And then what happens, right? You're even more thirsty, right? So you feel a, a brief moment of satiety, and then all of a sudden, you're even more hungry than when you started. Right? That salt craving, 90% of the time, what, you, what one really needs to do is drink two large glasses of cold water and see what happens. Right? That's the problem. So the problem is, I am saying I want pleasure. That will make me feel good. Uh, you know, I've had a rough day at work. Uh, da -da -da. I need something to make me, I need a pick-me-up. And so on. Right? Let me eat something. Let me watch something. Let me... But really, what I need is the Word of God. Really what I need is some holiness. The fathers, when they write about the war against pleasure, they call it the war against unholiness. Because they want to make the emphasis on what, what I need is not to destroy the pleasure. What I need is more holiness. My body, is my, my, myself, my person, is saying, I'm craving holiness. Give me holiness. I need holiness. I need the Word of God. I need... I, I need to eat. I need to eat from the Word of God. Try reading three or four chapters. It'll take you 20 minutes. Make that your, your two glasses of water test. Try reading three or four chapters. Next time you're tempted towards pleasure, 
Try reading three or four chapters from the Bible, take you about 15, 20 minutes, and see if you feel the same way afterwards. What about, what about self? And he tells them, throw yourself down, and the angels will catch you, and they will, and they will bury you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. What does Jesus answer him? You shall not test the Lord your God. Right? So what does it mean to not test? If you, if you don't put something to the test, what's, that's like a negative, what would the alternative be? What would the positive be? Hmm? Have faith. Have faith. Right? When you're tempted to believe in yourself, know that the solution to that temptation is to believe in God. The world tells us all this stuff which are counterfeits. Nonsense. Believe in yourself. Believe in God. Follow your heart. What does the Bible say? Jeremiah 17, 9. Above all things, the heart of man is very deceitful. That means that of all the people in the room right now, the most likely person to lie to me successfully is me. Y'all can try to lie to me, but I'll probably find you out. But me? Good luck. Good luck teasing that one apart. Right? Believe in yourself. <laughs> Whoever said that? Believe in God. Right? And, when, and for stuff... What's the solution for stuff? Takes him up on the mountain. I will give you the whole world. If only you bow down and worship me. What does is, what is Jesus answer him? Hmm? Worship God and him only you shall serve. You want to know what the cure for materialism is? The cure. Worship. Worship. Serve. Serve. You want to know? You, you, want, to, you, want, to, you want to kick materialism's but out of the room, you know what the solution is? Serving him, yes, any service is great. But you know, you know what will we'll kill it on the spot? Go spend some time with the poor. I'll tell you a quick story, and then we want to close this temptation chapter. Because we want to, we, we want to go from glory to glory. We want to leave this stuff behind. <coughs> right? It was uh, February in Canada, which is cold. And... Um, this uh, young woman uh, who serves in our church and so on was in the service of the poor with us. Um, that day, she had, uh, much earlier, she had ordered a, a Montclair coat. If you're familiar with Montclair, they're expensive. The longer and bigger they are, the more expensive they are. So it was like a full length Montclair coat. We're talking about like 1200 bucks or something, right? Canadian dollars, which are worth like, you know, like nothing in pounds, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's basically like six pounds or something. Like that. <laughs> Nonetheless, um, right? And so, but every time she orders stuff to her place, because she lives in an apartment building, it gets sent back, and then she has to go to the depot to get it, and whatever, like the mail place, and so on. So she sent it to her brother's place, and her brother said, no problem, you know, like, you can send it to her house, and I'll, when I see you at church on Sunday, I'll give it to you. So he saw her at church on Sunday, he put it in her trunk, and off she goes, and then Sunday evening we have our, our community dinner with the poor. So we're at our community dinner with the poor, and she's a, she's a very fashionable young woman. She's always wearing something beautiful and very well dressed. So um, this lady walks into the dinner, who's for sure, you know, had some kind of, of, of mental illness, um, and she walks in, she just starts shouting at the top of her lungs, does anybody have a coat? I need a coat. Does anybody have a coat? It's freezing outside. Have any of you been outside? She's just shouting, right? So we try to calm her down and try to sit her down and get her some food and try to calm her down so she doesn't kind of ruin the environment for everybody else. And she's not having anything of it. She doesn't want food. She wants a coat. So, of course, I only found out of it much later. Um, that young woman kind of like ran out of the hall and into the chapel like she didn't want to hear this, right? Because she has two coats. She has the one that she wore today in minus bazillion weather of Canada in February and the coat, the new coat in the trunk. Um, and she doesn't really want to part with either, right? Of course, I didn't know, I didn't know about this, right? Um, and I, even if I did, I mean, what would I have done? But anyways, nonetheless, so this woman is just, Anyway, she gets fed up of nobody wants to give her a coat, so the you know, lady leaves, right? She leaves and she goes back out into the cold and that's that. And we cleaned up that day and you know, that was, that was that, right? 
The following Sunday, we didn't have the service because we had decided that we were going to do a spiritual day for all the people who served in this service. We tried doing one on a different day, and people didn't show up, and they said, oh, I can't come, or it's too far, it's too close, it's this, it's that, it's not available on whatever, Tuesday night, blah, 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 whatever. So, I, you know, when I spoke with one of the people who mentors me, he said, do it at the time of the service, because all the people come to serve, so they obviously know how to get there, they obviously are able to get there, and they're obviously free on Sunday afternoons to come serve, so if they want to come to the spiritual day, they will come. So we do the spiritual day, and we put a big sign on the door, right, that says, no dinner today, right? But the door was open in case the some servants come, later they can come and then walk in through the door. So... Who walks in through the door halfway through our spiritual day? The lady, the coat lady, right? <laughs> right? The coat lady walks in and she just sits herself down on a chair. Like, and somebody was about to go tell her, like, there's no there's no service today, right? And she just sat down, like she was she was she was not going anywhere. Right? And so uh, somebody looked at me and I said, hey, bring her a plate, you know, maybe you know, feed her dinner, let her have some lunch or dinner. She can stay for as long as she wants, like because she's not. As long as she's not uh, disturbing anybody. She is a, a, a self-destructive person. Who, at the moment that lady walks in, bolts towards the closet where we lock all of our coats, grabs her Montclair coat, and gives it to the lady, right? This, this young woman. And then the lady kind of looks at her, she's like, I don't want a coat. She <laughs> <laughs> wants some dinner. Feed me a coat. <laughs> and the girl is, with tears streaming down her cheek, is begging her, while the speaker is speaking, is begging her full volume to take the coat. So I calmed her down and I took her coat and I went and hung it back up in the closet and locked it up and I'm like, you know, now who's the crazy one, right? <laughs> right? right? Our servants, right? Anyhow, and she went into the chapel and she was obviously distressed, so I left the spiritual day and went into the chapel and I told her, so and so, what's wrong? She said to me, remember, were you here last week? And I was like, uh, I was here for a bit. Were you here when that lady walked in, asked for the coat? And I told her, honestly, I don't remember. She said, that's the lady who came asking for the coat, like shouting at full volume for like 10 minutes, I want a coat, I need a coat. I'm like, uh, okay, like a distinct, I don't know, a lot of things happen in a week, I couldn't remember, right? She says to me, she says to me, she told me the story about the coat that she ordered to her brother, and she had two coats, right? She says, and I was, as I was driving home, all I could hear was Jesus whispering in my ear, I'm cold. I'm cold. I'm really cold. It's minus 20 outside, yeah, so and so, her name. I'm cold. And she stood to pray at night, and she stood. All she could hear Jesus saying to her is, I'm cold. I'm cold. And all week, her quiet time from day to day, and all the time that she spent with God, was Jesus telling her, I'm cold. I am cold. You have two coats. Can I, I, don't, I can have either one. It doesn't matter. Can I have one? I'm cold. So when she saw her man, all she wanted to do was offload that coat, any coat, take the shirt off my back, right? She said to me, I cried all week long. All week long, I begged Jesus to give me a second chance to give him my coat. That will cure your materialism, or my materialism. Let's say my materialism. The poor. God has given us the poor, as St. John Chrysostom tells us, as our diagnosticians. And if we hang around for long enough to give us a cure, the therapy. Enough, of, enough about that. Enough about that for now. The cure to temptation, all three temptations, and there are only three, dressed up in various different costumes, are those three, and you find them... You find them in Jesus' temptation in the Gospel of Matthew or Luke chapter 4, in both of them. And you find Jesus has given us the fair, He's given us the cure. He's given us the victory over temptation. If you wish to be victorious, He has given you and me the victory. Open now John 15. We're not here. We're, we're, we want to move. 
We want to move past sin and temptation. We want to move to the abundant life. <coughs> Jesus has come to give us life, and that with abundance. Not, not just drips and drabs. St. John the Baptist says, For the Lord does not give the Spirit by measure. God does not give you the Spirit with an eyedropper. You know, here you go, two drops, here you go, three drops, here you go. No, He gives. When He gives, He gives. When He gives, He gives. When He opens the tap, He leaves it running. And He pours out. And the limiting factor of how much you and I carry away is not the generosity of God or His willingness, but our ability, our ability <coughs> to carry it out. They have these, uh, these uh, open buffets in Toronto, right? And they give you like a, like a, a tea saucer, you know? You go, you go up to the buffet with this tea saucer, you know? And you're like, you want everything that's there. And there's no room in the plate. And man, I'm going to burn more calories going back and forth trying to fill this tea saucer with food. Yeah, 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 man, give me a normal sized plate, right? Give me a normal sized plate. God is like an open buffet ready to give you all <coughs> that you can carry away. But the question is, how much can you and I carry? The, the word abundant is used also in John 15. Can somebody find it for us? Yes. I do find this. Maybe it's not the word in the New King James, it's not the word abundant. Maybe it was in the New Revised. Look at verse 8. By this my Father is glorified. That you bear much fruit. That you bear much fruit. Don't ever believe that it is the will of God for you not to have fruit. Don't ever believe it. There is always, where God is, there is always fruit. There is always power. There is always change. There is always grace. Always. 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 Maybe the fruit will be in your ministry, in the lives of others. Maybe the fruit will be in yourself. Right? You're, you're serving people and nobody looks like they're changing at all. You don't know what happens behind closed doors. You don't hear their confessions. But it sure looks like nothing is changing. But you, you are changing. You are growing. Maybe. Or maybe the fruit is happening all around you. Maybe everyone is seeing the love that you have for each other. And you don't look like you're changing, and I don't look like I'm changing. But the whole world around us is changing. But we live in our own little bubble, so we don't know. Maybe. But there's always fruit. Always. If God is present, there is fruit. If there's God is present... He is present with power. I love that verse in Luke 5, where it, <clears throat> you know, the man they let down through the roof, and it says, only in the Gospel of Luke, it says in that account, it says, and the Spirit was present to heal them. And the power of God, sorry, was present to heal them. Wherever, wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Spirit of the Lord brings power. But the trouble the trouble is, is sometimes the, the Spirit of the Lord in my life is getting siphoned off, right? Sometimes, sometimes when you look at the vine, there's a branch that has two little grapes on it. Two, they're all green. They're all very early in the season. They're little green grapes, you know, little marbles. And then on the other side, there's like two <coughs> big clusters of tiny little green grapes. And they're both growing off an equally sized trunk. The, the, the trunk of the vine wise goes in two, it splits in two different directions, and the trunks are the same size. This one has leaves and leaves and leaves and leaves, and two little grapes. And this one has two clusters. Now, if the sap is going to get equally divided between those two branches, 
right? What are the grapes on this side going to look like? You're going to have two big, fat, juicy grapes. And what are the grapes on the other side going to look like? You're going to have bunches of little raisins, little shriveled up raisins, right? And here you're going to have tons of leaves, and here you're going to have less leaves. Now, as a wise vine dresser, only the father is the wise vine dresser. Was that a, 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 it was an equitable distribution of the sap between the, the branches. But did it yield a lot of fruit? <laughs> Two grapes and a bunch of raisins? Ah, something, I guess. What if early in the season, you would have said, Two grapes gotta go. And you cut, you cut off that branch, you pruned that branch. Now all the sap is going towards the two clusters. And at the end of the season, you end up with two big, fat, juicy clusters, full, ripe with juicy grapes. What was a better use, right? My beloved brothers and sisters, as somebody in need of this more than of you, you and me, I want to tell you our biggest problem is not sin. Our biggest problem is not temptation or the devil or I don't know what. Our biggest problem is our <coughs> divided hearts, our divided interests. Our biggest problem is the notifications ringing on my phone all day long, not allowing me to focus, to concentrate. What we're in need of is a little bit of pruning. And the stuff we're pruning is not bad. It's not bad. It's a good branch. It's not a cancerous branch. It's not a sick branch. It's not an unhealthy branch. It's a good branch. It's a good branch. When you decide to spend less time with some of your friends, to spend more time with God, or to spend some time in service, they're good friends. They're not bad people. They're good people. They're not leading you to sin. They're not trying to make you uh, prostitute yourself. Or, you know, they're, they're, they're good people. They're good people. You know, they're not immoral or... Right? I'm taking one example, right? Uh, frequently people <laughs> tell me, when I can't come to church, I'm studying. I want you to study and I want you to do well. But I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I believe that whatever God gave you, you have enough time to do. And whatever you don't have time for, God will bless. God will bless. And I'm the living example of it. Not in so much that God has blessed me, but how unfaithful I have been and how much God has blessed me. Not because of my unfaithfulness, but because of His grace. Because He is good. Don't sacrifice the things that will give you life and give you power for the things that won't. We need a bit of pruning. We need a bit of pruning. And that bit of pruning... Sorry about that. That bit of pruning is what will save us. Glory be to God forever.